Okay. We are back <laughs> with number four. I had to go let my dogs out, and I was just walking around the house going... Bew, 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 bew. I don't know why. <sighs> yeah. Look at that callus. Oh. <laughs> All right. Enough of this callous music. Let's get into part four. Perhaps 40,000 warriors marched east that year led in battle by the vizier Ali B. Issa. Yet, al Mamun had powerful friends too. Most notably, Al-Fadl B. Al-Rabi, perhaps an unlikely figure. Al-Rabi hadn't always been a Muslim, presumably being born a Zoroastrian. He'd only converted towards the end of Harun's reign, having been patronized by the Barmakids just after their fall and rising swiftly as a result, being attached as a teacher to the young al Mamun, eventually becoming an integral advisor. Yet Al-Rabi and al Mamun both had the wisdom to know that they weren't the right men to push the Khalifal army back. For that, they picked the best man for the job, along with the most elite soldiers they could find. Nevertheless, when General Tahir al-Hussein marched out from the city of Ray in 811, accompanied by no more than 5,000 soldiers, for al Mamun, the situation seemed bleak. On that day, however, out on the Persian plains near Ray, al-Hussein, heavily outnumbered as he was, won a crushing victory. Ali B. Issa was killed, his 40,000 strong army scattered to the wind, and al -Amin's reputation landed a devastating blow. In the aftermath of the battle, al Mamun's position in the east was secure, but he wasn't finished yet. Ordering together all the men he could muster, a large number of them Persians, probably along with various contingents of Turkic slave soldiers captured in battle in Central Asia and press ganged into service. And together, they began the march to Baghdad. The great city was about to face the first siege in its long history. By 813, al Mamun's forces surrounded the capital, inadvertently laying waste to much of the surrounding countryside. Rival local militias serving each of the two caliphs further added to the chaos, with many simply... Okay, so you're going to lay waste to the surrounding countryside, and you're going to siege on Baghdad. Okay. Are you destroying the countryside to destroy the morale of the people? Are you trying to stop any kind of uh, destruction of crops or food supplies wouldn't it be easier to just take control of those just commandeer them so that you get that or are we just talking they're just destroying property they're kind of doing like the the mongols did and they're just wiping everything out I don't know taking advantage of the carnage to enrich themselves at the expense of their neighbors everything. yet al -Amin refused to surrender even as giant catapults indiscriminately launched fiery death into the city and inside the walls not for the last time Poets and writers lamented the sorry situation with protest poetry. At the heart of it all, holed up in his great-grandfather's citadel, crippled by indecision, sat the Caliph al -Amin. Dominated by an overbearing mother and controlling advisors, any reputation he'd once enjoyed was now largely destroyed. 
It was a sorry situation indeed. All that remained now was to give himself up, but who to surrender to? If he chose the right person, he might live. Eventually, the Caliph agreed to surrender to an old family friend. But en route, he was betrayed by Al-Rabi and eventually killed by a group of Persian soldiers. In truth, the execution had been botched. Perhaps Al-Mamun's desire for vengeance getting the better of him. As tales of al amins alleged stoicism and bravery in the face of death spread far and wide, he very quickly became a martyr, acquiring far more popularity in death than he ever had in life. Huh. It would be six years before the fighting fully ground to a halt. During that time, Baghdad remained a hotbed of resistance to the new regime. Finally, by 819, after the final flight into hiding of the anti-caliph Ibrahim b al-Mahdi, al-Mamun finally made his triumphal entrance into Baghdad. After close to a decade of carnage, the war was finally over and the recovery could begin. And what a recovery it was. It didn't take long for Baghdad to begin to grow again as former inhabitants returned and new residents moved in. Trade flourished, construction and engineering boomed, and science and culture reached new heights never before seen. Of course, those in power who had served Harun al-Rashid and subsequently al-Amin could not be trusted. They were mostly wiped out or at least removed from positions of power. Yet, Al-Mamun did not command a large loyal army. He had no equivalent to the tens of thousands of Khorasani warriors who had swept the early Abbasids into power, nor the zealous volunteer jihadis who had served his father. He had to negotiate for military support, primarily turning to the most powerful Persian dynasty of the day, the Tarahids. It was an especially profitable arrangement for both sides and would last for another 50 years to come. Thus, with the regime change came an influx and reinvigoration of Persian influence in the Caliphate. Yet, Persians hadn't been the only new group to enter Baghdad in that year. Along with Al-Mamun came Turks, fierce nomads originating on the Central Asian steppe. In the years that followed, Many unreliable military posts, notably in Egypt, began to be replaced with Turks personally loyal to the Caliphal family and no one else. It worked extremely well to begin with, but just like with the Germanic peoples in the later Roman Empire, well, let's just say we'll certainly be hearing more of the Turks. By the time of Al-Mamun's death in 833, the damage dealt by the civil war had not only dissipated, but the caliphate entered an unprecedented era of learning and scientific achievement. The population of the city grew close to 500,000 people. In an age when London and Paris barely had 10,000 inhabitants to speak of, it was very possibly the largest city in the world. Wow. and had a trade network to match. Items coming in included carpets from Persia, linens from Egypt, pearls from the Gulf, glassware from the Levant, metalwork from Syria, perfume from Arabia, spices and gems from India, furs, honey and slaves from north of the Black Sea, ivory gold and slaves from Africa, and porcelain from China. Al Mamun enjoying vast monetary reserves from his monopoly over the silk and spice roads, lavished patronage on scholars. For he, more so than any other caliph, was a genuine intellectual. Like a Muslim Marcus Aurelius, having far-reaching interests in science and philosophy. Though the Beit al-Hikmah, the House of Knowledge, had been established by Harun al-Rashid, and may have even been begun to a certain extent under Al-Mansur, 
under Al Mamun, it would become the greatest seat of learning the world had ever seen. Thousands of scholars amassed in Baghdad during this time, traveling from the ancient cities of Greek and Roman wisdom in Egypt, Syria, and even further afield in Sicily and Crete, as well as from the old Sasanian Empire in Persia. Persian culture had always held a desire for knowledge as a paramount concern, and as Islam continued to merge with old Sasanian traditions, this intellectual curiosity filtered in. Not only did al Mamun call for scholars, but he called for their texts too. Having anyone rewarded handsomely for any ancient books they translated into Arabic. Friendly rivalries began to grow up between competing scholars over who could find and translate the rarest books, with ancient Greek texts being especially favoured. Books were shipped in from the other side of the world, and expeditions sent out to retrieve others. In addition to thousands of old Persian texts, the likes of Hippocrates, Galen, Archimedes, Euclid. It's pretty impressive. This guy went out of his way to bring in all this, this uh, knowledge for the people. I'm sure it was selfish. He also, you know, wanted to read it himself. But still, Euclid, Plato, and Aristotle were all saved from oblivion by Al Mamun's genius. It wasn't just Muslim scholars who were favored either. Men of any nationality or religion besides pagans could rise up. Be they Jews, Christians, or even Zoroastrians. Very cool. Great exploratory expeditions were launched too by Arab geographers seeking to map out the known world. In addition to the literary, scientific and engineering achievements of the Caliphate, mathematics effectively began during this era too. The very concept of zero and the numbers we know today being imported from India and improved upon, until eventually they entered Europe via Muslim Spain replacing Roman numerals, thus eventually allowing for computing. In 833, whilst on campaign against the Byzantines, al Mamun died. The Caliphate had reached the greatest heights it ever saw. Baghdad was the greatest city in the world. Yet the cracks were beginning to show. Upon his death, al Mamun's original choice for successor, his son Al-Abbas, a war hero, was overruled. Instead, a younger son of Harun al-Rashid was able to muscle his way into power, utilizing an elite retinue of Turkic slave soldiers to do so. They would prop him up for the rest of his reign, though over the century to come, they and others like them would cause havoc for the empire at times reducing caliphs to prisoners in their own palaces. But it wasn't just the Turks that the caliphs had to contend with. To the north, Byzantine border garrisons waited for the perfect moment to strike. To the east, Persian dynasts bided their time. To the west, North African Berbers had already gained their independence and yet more would follow. And even sub-Saharan African slaves in the riverlands of southern Iraq would have their part to play. The next hundred years, the slow decline and fall of the Abbasid Caliphate is one of the most captivating eras in all of human history. What goes up must come down. Yep. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that. That was really good. Al Mamun. Pretty impressive guy. And the fact that he didn't hold who you were 
against you in terms of the society. He just allowed everyone, you know, hey, look, if you bring something good to the table and you can come up, then we're all better. I think that's impressive. He had the little, he had the early American melting pot. Except pagans. Apparently he didn't like pagans. You guys go worship your head soldiers. Your head soldiers, your head statues. Leave us alone. All right, that was good. So, if you want to donate to the channel, you can. There's a little thanks button. You can send some cash. Helps the channel. If not, I'm still going to be making videos. Um, my foot got a cramp in it. Sorry. A donation would probably take the cramp away. It didn't. <laughs> Oh, my toe shouldn't curl like that. Okay, it's getting better. Oh, that toe popped. And cramp went away. It's a miracle. All right, so give it a thumbs up. That would help. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. That helps. And until next time... Have a good day, have a good night.